Hey everybody, so today we are going to be talking about FAIR data principles, specifically in life sciences, but this has a large application across different disciplines. And especially if you are in data science, ontology, or knowledge graph, this is absolutely something that you should be aware of. So if this is something that is new to you, or maybe you are a veteran, you will probably still enjoy this video because I am joined by a special guest who has over a decade of experience working in FAIR data principles, for the life sciences. And also, this is the first video I'm going to be publishing two times. So for those that know, I did a poll on LinkedIn asking if a longer form podcast version was of interest. Came out 50-50. So what I'm going to do is anytime I have a special guest on the channel, I'm going to post the shorter form version, which is under 20 minutes on LinkedIn and YouTube the longer form version that is going to be more of a behind the scenes because there's less editing involved and you're gonna hear a lot more from the guest and myself, that's going to be the longer form version that I'm only going to post on YouTube. Just so you don't get a lot of weird emails if you are getting notifications, I'm going to be posting these at the exact same time and I'm going to put it in the title so you know which one is which. And depending on which version you're watching right now, if it says podcast in the title, this is the longer form version. If you are more interested in the short form, link up above as well as down below. If you are looking for the podcast version, make sure that, again, I'm going to put a link down below and I'm going to put a link up above right now for the longer form podcast if you are more interested in that. All right, so with that, let's go get started. So today we are here to talk about something that is incredibly important. You've probably heard this from many consultancies if you're talking about data projects, and that is FAIR. So today we are here with Nick. So Nick, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, and yeah, thanks very much for uh, inviting me to your uh, your channel today. Yeah, I'm, I'm Nick Lynch. I'm based in the UK. Uh, I used to work for a number of pharma and biotech num companies. Uh, including AstraZeneca. And now we run a small uh, consulting company called Curly Research. And we're lucky to be involved and working with lots of uh, great groups across the globe who are uh, working on data, uh, particularly in life science across its uh, sort of from the beginning of, of early target discovery through to later clinical and, and onwards and, and fair data, which I can explain in a minute. Our data is really, you know, the key buzzword that I think is is impacting yeah. our whole industry. Yeah. And, and and as a sort of brief intro to FAIR is that it, it stands for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And and it's been around or with us as an acronym. It's quite a nice acronym, I suppose. And it, mm -hmm. it's certainly gathered uh, interest from from sort of management as well in that it's been with us for about six or seven years from some early work from a number of people, particularly in, in academia yeah. and interested in publishing data too, because, mm -hmm. you know, I think many of the the standards that come around data come from how people want to disseminate uh, research data. But yeah. the purpose of FAIR is about making, as it says in its sort of in the abbreviation, the process of making that data useful, because I think in, you know, it, it yeah. all through R&D and through the centuries that we've been doing R&D in, in life science, we collect data. And obviously that data was, you know, with back to, you know, 300, 400 years ago, it was handwritten in inscribed. <laughs> we've obviously evolved uh, uh, f from that, but only until about 20, you know, 15 years ago was the concept of sort of more electronic capture of data, sort of the, you know, the norm in the sense of the notebook that people mm -hmm. use mm -hmm. to, to, to capture data. And so electronic notebooks were only really sort of being introduced to our industry in the sort of mid 2000s, at least mm -hmm. in, in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And that sort of note taking part of our work you know, very much needs is really important because it's the beginning of the experiment and mm -hmm. it's all about, you know, the, the sort of the, the design test, sorry, the design, make, test, analyze sort of the cycle that can can be applied to all sciences where you you design what you, you want to do, you, you, you try and you make it or you carry out the experiment, mm -hmm. you validate uh, what you're wanting to do and then you start again or you analyze the broader corpus of data uh, that you have access to. 
And, and I, so I, think, for- I think I think those are really important too to to focus on um, in this instance. So first of all, I I am an avid lab folder user, <laughs> so I use these kinds of tools constantly. And one thing I also just kind of to frame up some some real problems that I have seen that FAIR does help with is um, when I was doing my dissertation, one of the things I was really focusing on was a uh, which, which method was going to work the best for my experiment. And what I very quickly realized was in the world of knowledge graph and semantics, which you know, haven't been what they are, um, you know, the more modern understanding of it. Ontology has been around since Greeks, right? So I'm not talking about that. Um, it, you know, it's kind of more mo- modern. Um, I wasn't finding a lot. And I actually feel like if we had more resources for the entire process that you just outlined, that it would make understanding the methodology and how people come to certain decisions so much more transparent and another area, uh, a a more rich, because it does exist as an area of research, but a a more rich area of research. And I would love and welcome that. So I'm a huge fan of fair data if we can get more people using it. Yeah. And, and like, you know, I think it's been the buzzwords now for a while around, you know, that data is an asset and mm-hmm. it's about, you know, both uh, generating that asset with the right amount of uh, data. We spend mm-hmm. a lot of effort perhaps protecting it, which is definitely important when mm-hmm. it comes to, you know, personally identifiable information and clinical data. But we also have to show the value of having collected it. It, it shouldn't be yeah. just sort of put in a safe and and, and <laughs> forgotten forever. And I think again, back back to to your original question about you know where it started and stuff. So this this sort of uh, this sort of building momentum because of this you know particularly more recently you know volumes of data within R and D has have have blossomed out of all proportion. Yeah. The, the ability to to capture high dimensional mm-hmm. data and and all the experiments that go on. And if anything, that data you can have large volumes, but it's very dense and yeah. and it's just for one experiment yeah you can equally have the complete opposite which is a, a large cross-section of data mm-hmm. but quite thin mm-hmm. and and for both of those sort of data types or or or, or sort of uh, sort of volume cubes mm-hmm. the the importance of fair is critical because having mm-hmm. cr- you know created the data so that yeah. in a way the findable part you can break down fair into sort of these th- there are three main parts and in a way the reusable bit is about then the sort of the later use which we can cover later so the findable mm-hmm. is about giving something uh an identifier so that's mm-hmm. so I- in terms of the basics you know we we have as individuals probably have our identifiers in our social security system mm-hmm. or our governmental mm-hmm. system and the same applies to assets that we create in life science you, you make a new molecule and it'll get an ID. A, a protein has an ID from, say, a, a, a registered system, a registered system like Uniprot, and, and a mm-hmm. gene will have a name and hopefully an ID. Mm-hmm. But I, but I, I but the the point of these identifiers for fair is that they're persistent. So a, a persistent URL or URI mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. critical to obviously not name the set. Sorry, two different things mm-hmm. with, with the same identifier. Absolutely. And, you know, Nick, one thing that, you know, FAIR is by itself a very important thing to be talking about. But from my perspective and what a lot of people on this channel know about is knowledge graphs, which also use a lot of the same themes that you're talking about, like UIDs. So, you know, imagine you're using that new molecule that you have designed and it has a UID, but you want to now put it into a different experiment than its home experiment. And so being able to use that same ID across the different experiments allows you to then be able to tie them all in together, which is not, you know, that is a very basic, you know, when you're trying to understand the ripple effect of things that you're doing in experiments, maybe a knowledge graph would be helpful for that. But there are so many other use cases that using FAIR and its principles and knowledge graph and its principles, they make this beautiful little baby that's going to help so many people understand how things are interconnected and what things worked and what things didn't. So this is a big reason I'm I'm a big uh, supporter of this as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. And so with, with that sort of the fundamental principle of giving something an identifier, I mean, it sounds simple. It, in a way, it's quite hard to do universally. <laughs> Truly unique ideas are, are difficult. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And so you can, and I think this is, again, a, it, one can think of sort of uh, onion rings or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, sort of concentric circles mm -hmm. coming out that within our, our own, let's say we're working in one organization, managing identifies is one sort of job it's more manageable when you start to then as you mm -hmm. said work between organizations mm -hmm. and this is again is another a, a sort of reason for this being ever more important is the nature of life science it now means that there's no one company that does mm -hmm. everything you know yeah. we're before maybe 20 years ago that the larger farmer had a more was done within them because mm -hmm. they were bigger and it was the nature of, of how they worked. But now innovation is happening in so many different places, just like in other industries, but particularly in life science, where you've yeah. got, yes, the existing larger farmer like AstraZeneca, Novartis, Roche, mm -hmm. et cetera. But there's a huge long tail of uh, emerging biotechs, yes. research collaborative uh, organizations, perhaps funded by philanthropic methods mm -hmm. like Bill and Melinda Gates and Chan mm -hmm. Zuckerberg. You've got large charitable groups like Cancer Research UK here, mm -hmm. obviously NIH funding of, yeah. of many things and other countries too. And then, you know, other things in between, you know, large sort of pan uh, country uh, groups fund research like uh, one of in Europe, we have something called IHI, which is Innovative Health Initiative. It used to be called IMI. Mm -hmm. uh, so they did a lot of public private work, public private initiatives that funded research. And all of that is creating data. Mm -hmm. And equally, it means that the breadth of data is growing, but also mm -hmm. research hardly doesn't always, it's very rare in happening in just one organization. It's collaborations. Yeah. And that's even more important for managing data and managing yeah. that I'm calling X with this identifier yeah. and I'm giving it to you to, to work on. That mm -hmm. identifier is going to live with that uh, asset, uh, entity, yeah. for its life cycle. So well, and the UIDs of the individual researchers on it too, right? Because that, that adds a chain of custody of who's doing what with it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, one could get into whole areas of, you know, how manage one manages IP in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, individual contributions. But yeah, just knowing that person X has, has contributed or, you know, uh, synthesized that molecule or run that assay is really critical for, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the general running of, of good data management, as yep. well as even more importantly, when that data perhaps is, is pertaining to that person, when it, it's yeah. to do with health records and yep. other, you know, other sensitive data. Yeah, so, and, and then the ethics, right? I mean, there's a lot of ethical concerns that if we had uh, more of the metadata associated with individual pieces to an asset, not just the asset as a whole, it really helps those that are in the data science side that are using these data sets to use them appropriately and also understand if their you know, machine learning model is balanced or not, because they're not taking one giant asset, they actually know individual components and then can make better, better decisions that are hopefully ethical and um, not uh, steamrolling those that are <laughs> contained in that data set. Uh, absolutely. So, you know, back to, you know, the, the sort of the, the sort of the beginnings was, yes, they came up with the what were called the fair principles. And it's mm -hmm. almost like a it's a charter of 15 mm -hmm. principles, each mm -hmm. number of principles against each of those, the F, the A, the I and the R. And you you already mentioned the one about interoperability. And, and that, in a way, is when it's one way we like to think about is that the F and the A are sort of manageable in, in mm -hmm. we'll, we can come into details later if, 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 if you want. But the interoperable bit is when it starts to get hard, as we've been yes. saying, because <laughs> you, you mentioned ontologies. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the, the fact is that there are many ontologies and many more will be created uh, in the future. But if Just anything... Just go to BioPortal and see how many yeah, are out there now. <laughs> absolutely. And then, you know, equally, there are uh, ones that people need to create more internally because, mm -hmm. of you know, that they've gone beyond what they found in the public yeah. domain or they're doing something which is particularly IP sensitive. And so they have to create mm -hmm. their own sort of hybrid ontology. 
and then there's just ones you know people often just create one for, for the sake of it perhaps yeah but that interoperability of, of, is really critical to yeah. support what you were saying about knowledge graphs because mm -hmm. that ability to map between you know let's say mesh and snowmed some yep. more, more sort of you know health orientated ontologies or equally ones that are used earlier on in research that's critical to both have the those principles of an identify you know this this purpose of, of fair data should applies not just to the data but to the metadata itself mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so it's just as important for the for the ontologies to be suitably uh, marked up in this way with an identifier a label and 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 suitable sort of nomenclature because that helps it then the, the data that the, the, the describing data the metadata can then be used in in any downstream processing or analysis or model building as as you said earlier yeah it's the provenance right and um one thing that i want to highlight too because i think a lot of people that are not familiar with linked data interoperable principles um on their own which is separate from fair but included in fair mm -hmm. Uh, is mapping. ETL is the bane of most people's existence, <laughs> right? And the merge and the dupes and is this thing really the same thing as this thing? Now, obviously, everything is not perfect on the, you know, pharma side or or the, the um, health record side of things. But the mapping between you know, SNOMED and MESH, for instance, or um, you know, any of the other medical ontologies and, and taxonomies, because this is so well understood in that specific discipline, I have found that the mapping is so much easier. The ETL of that data is so much easier because you can track exactly and, and you almost get um, a Rosetta Stone moment with MeSH, for instance. MeSH is in many different languages, it maps to SNOMED, it maps to RX norm, it maps to all of these different things because of those UIDs. And so therefore, if you have mesh mapped into your data, you also have all of those other data sets mapped kind of within one, one hop away from each other. And you have a very high degree of confidence because it's using a lot of these fair principles. Absolutely. I mean, so there's some great initiatives in that sort of later stage world with Odyssey, which, which mm -hmm. is a, a fantastic initiative where really their purpose is to be able to map on the left hand side, you know, lots of different data sources, but to, to map them to a common object, common model, which mm -hmm. is the sort of the role that Odyssey, OHDSI, we can probably share the links. Yeah, afterwards. we'll put links down below. Uh, uh, that, uh, you know, that that common mapping is critical really to how the purpose of Odyssey is an attempt to allow you to, from different sort of health records, to bring data together under a common set of, of terms. Mm -hmm. And it, it spends a lot of time doing that mapping in, in a tool like Atlas and, and mm -hmm. some other of the tools that they've developed in that group. And, and although, you know, and, and FAIR is really fundamental to to what they're doing, because out of that, means that you you've done the mapping so you know you might have collected it under mesh or icd10 mm -hmm. but actually you're 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 presenting it back out into in a common common exactly. standard yep and that so much makes it easier to mm -hmm. then look across data sets which have could have come from different research groups mm -hmm. and and been done in different ways or different hospitals but that gives you that common language and without the fair principle at least the certainly the i bit of fair yes that that wouldn't be wouldn't be possible at all or be so much more effort that you'd, com you'd be perennially per repeating what you've just done a year ago to, to remap things. Which and, is and kind of it. the case in a lot of other disciplines that I have to work in. I don't only get to work in this space. Right? So when I'm looking at um, things, I would <clears> say um, in any of the humanities is a great <clears> example <throat> where um, because there's a lot of time series things too, and a lot of geographic regions, and they're constantly changing their names and who owns what, and borders are are moving and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Getting the eye for fair is a little bit trickier than this thing is called a heart attack, but it's also called um, myocardial infarction, yeah. right? Like you yeah. know, those two things are the same thing, mm -hmm. even no matter where you are in the in the globe, they are two of the same thing, um, yeah. and and. I don't know. I, I'm such a geek, but that just makes me so happy. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, and, and and you know, as you say, many industries have, have. I suppose it's always down to a compromise as to what you know yeah. is important for that industry. And 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 I don't certainly life science is no way perfect. You, you know, yeah, we, it's it, it's a right. it's a continued battle, but partly because of, again, partly to do with how the data is captured. And I think that's a a critical bit for fair that there's mm-hmm. you know people have coined the term sort of fair born fair, mm-hmm. which, which mm-hmm. the which is you know I think we. As you know, because although people have been doing fair for a long time, it just perhaps has been branded this way. Mm-hmm. But the, the purpose of whenever you're perhaps finding new data, one has got the choice of doing, uh, put, drawing a line in the sand and saying, OK, everything before this date is historical or, or mm-hmm. you know, uh, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be as rigorous as I was, mm-hmm. as I will be going forward. Mm-hmm. And I think this is the dilemma we have a little bit in life science because we've got we've collected loads of data up to this point yeah some of it's good some of it's less useful Mm -hmm. and that's been shown in in terms of the general reproducibility of science you know there's been some sort of papers or analysis done to Mm -hmm. show that you know our our science isn't always reproducible for there and and hopefully capturing more data about an experiment will will allow people to know whether whether they can reproduce or whether they are reproducing it yeah. that, that's the critical yeah. bit and, and that challenge exists in, in in terms of the 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 sort of the challenge that we have in terms of reproducibility but but also that you know as we as we we, we think about data today we want to make data born fair and that means that the yeah. tools that we're using to capture it have to be more semantically enriched and must right. be yeah. using the ontologies as best we can and mm-hmm. and reduce the amount of free text entry so that when someone puts an entry in for say the protein or yeah. the target they're not just free text entries they really are pointing to the the ontology just like you and and I think that's particularly the problem with with health records is that they're not always a lot of it will be direct from the doctor's notes yeah which yeah. will not be done in a way that's particularly semantically enriched from yeah. from day one. And that can yeah. cause a real problem uh, downstream. And, and there's more and more tools and, and resources out there, I think, that are trying to hack into that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but also for, for those that, you know, are not as familiar with, you know, not just semantics, but FAIR in general, the reproducibility um, has a very specific meaning in the R&D and scientific space, right? And the importance of it, and this is really to the audience, not to Nick, because Nick knows, <laughs> is, um, you know, if if you want to stand on the shoulders of giants, you know, that, that saying, you kind of have to know what the previous giants did and how they did it and what they did well, what they did not do well, what did they try, what worked, what didn't, in what thresholds. Understanding all of that specific understanding of not just the outcome, but what led to the outcome helps you then be able to recreate it and say, oh yeah, it did actually work and confirm that 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 one study did in fact do what it said it did. And also to make sure that if you want to use that and say, wait a minute, I think I can do it better. Or wait a minute, maybe they didn't take this into consideration. You can do it exactly the same and then add those other aspects to it. And so you don't have to reproduce the wheel. Right. It's the yeah, reproducing no, of, of the, the the study, not the wheel that that you probably have somewhere else. No, that, that was a great summary. And I, and I think you bring up a good point about, you know, we, we, we do collect a lot of data. I mean, one of the one of the problems, perhaps more generally in, in probably all of science, is that we tend to only report the positives. You know, people, mm-hmm. you know, people tend to not be able to report right papers about negatives necessarily. And that's another challenge that if we had. Mm-hmm more sort of automated ways of capturing data it would allow us to both capture the the successful react mm-hmm. uh, experiments with the appropriate metadata mm-hmm. but also it would in, in in doing that we would be automatically capturing the t- the times when it wasn't it hasn't worked mm-hmm. because again the, the knowing the uh, the, the, being able to capture everything is much is going to be far more valuable in the future because at the moment probably the models that we are building, particularly with you know the, the buzzwords around AI and machine yeah. learning, they're mostly built on successful things because yes. there isn't the data on the unsuccessful things. Yeah, and the more that we can capture sort of fair level data on a, on, on the breadth of science, breadth of any mm-hmm. well any any discipline, 
it will make those models much, hopefully much better quality because it will see the full breadth yeah. of the experiments run and well, not and, just the successful ones. Yeah. And I, I think that having uh, as a practitioner in, in that space, in machine learning space, I think this would also make for better data scientists because oftentimes I come up against people that super brilliant. They have PhDs in, in computer science and advanced semantics and other things. I mean, I can count myself among those people, but if, if students that are highly educated are coming out and they've only learned on the successes and not so much on the failures and the lessons learned when they get into, instead of academia in the workforce, you you have retros, right? You have these moments where you have to learn from your mistakes. I think because they didn't actually have to learn on a lot of them, not saying none, because there are some, uh, it, it deters them from then sharing some of their failures, even in the workforce. And it's like this vicious cycle where um, it's almost because we're not seeing a lot of it uh, meaning the the lessons learned and the failures and and the whole process of scientific inquiry, we're less inclined as maybe new students or new in the workforce to then uh, report on those things ourselves, mm-hmm. and that only makes things worse because you don't have anyone to come in and help mentor you, right? Mm-hmm. So not only the fair principles and being able to reproduce things and all of those lovely things, but from a pure educational standpoint, I also see some things in there that fair could help with um, that are more tangential than probably what fair meant to be. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, I think, you know, one of the first things people say about fair is it, it's a journey in the sense that, yeah. uh, you know, the, the, the principles that were written can seem like tablets of stone and, <laughs> and that they 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 tell people or their their purpose was to inform about the sort of the best practice the principles i think what what the industry has been going through over this last particularly last 5 years is working out well how do we adopt fair you exactly. know both within our organization uh, between organizations mm-hmm. And then all these challenges that I mentioned about, you know, how far back do we go? So do yes. we do retrospective mm-hmm. verification? Mm-hmm. How can we be, be better at prospective? So this fair at birth process yeah. and then the general, uh, I suppose, both the the tooling, the, you know, the, the tools that we need, the software that we need, but also the general awareness that need the culture change, because none of this is going to be possible without change management. Yes. And and the, and and although we talk about data a lot and 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 technology, it you know the people part of this is is critical because mm-hmm. you know a data is an asset, b it has to be part of the culture of an organization mm-hmm. really to be to to be for that organization to be successful, both at the beginning of of the data life cycle, so those that are creating data, and all the way through to the end. You you mentioned the role of data scientists that sort of maybe bridge the gap between mm-hmm. the the creator and and others that might be wanting to exploit data later on and build from a data science dashboard or a model and it's trying to get that real culture shift in terms of everyone is responsible for data it, it, it's everyone's responsibility mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it is and i think that when you're looking at responsibility too you know, getting into that, how do you get into FAIR? How do you keep FAIR going? Um, It's got a a lot of this stuff starts with grassroots and there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's a good place to start. But one thing that I, I strongly suggest is you, you have to get stakeholders at the top to really understand the importance of this, because as soon as you start talking specifically interoperability or reproducibility, uh, they're okay with that to a point. Right. And then when you start to say, well, it's going to take this much effort, they quickly lose interest. And so it it really is, you know, and a lot of things on the channel here, a lot of uh, videos I have kind of walk through how do you get buy in for things like this? Because, you know, I, I was told very early on in my career, we were talking about interoperability. Fair wasn't like the word it is today. Um. I was talking to someone at Johnson & Johnson, very high up in their metadata space. And he's like, you know what? 
I cannot get anyone to understand why we need interoperability. They just don't buy into it. They can't see the ROI on it. And that stuck with me because I'm like, that can't be true. It can't be because there's so it's metadata is such an integral part to not only what you are developing today, but to make sure that when you're audited, you know what's going on. And, you know, who touched what, you know, if there's some security breach of some sort and the ethics and all of these things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it's not fun to go in with a story of, well, there are risks here, right? You don't want to go in and, and be like, well, we need to do this because of a scare tactic. But, you know, I, I, I describe this as the big storm cloud of data that's hanging over all of us. And if you don't know what's in that storm cloud and it starts to rain on you, you can be in trouble, right? And so mm -hmm. you don't want to go in with a scare tactic, but it is a risk mitigation strategy. Usually what I start the conversation with, um, followed by then innovation and, you know, all the other lovely things that come along with it. So um, I just say that because sometimes people are like, yeah, but how do I start? <laughs> That's at least from my perspective, how I've started this in the past. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And as you say, you know, I think for some well, for I think the, the the sort of leadership of many organizations have embraced the importance of data and many leaders have, have talked about that, you know, not ju just in, in life science, but much, much more broadly. And then obviously some some companies are much more focused on data than, you know, for pharma, it's it's not just about the data. It's about obviously, you know, helping the patients. But data is a key element of that right yes. through from early research all the way through to what the patient expects and, yeah. and, and the wider sort of, uh, as we talked about, sort of electronic health records and that feedback loop uh, that we have. But I think the change management and, and I think one thing we find in all our projects is the ability to do smaller projects to start mm -hmm. with, to try and show some of that value because exactly. it can seem mm -hmm. daunting partly because that fair is easy to say and very hard <laughs> harder to do right that that that, that p p the approach of trying to run a pilot which is or poc which is related to something that's important but you can scope it and and not feel that you're having to boil the ocean of your mm -hmm. company's data but you can just hone in on a particular bit and hone in based on some of the you know the, the findable bit the accessible bit mm -hmm. the interoperable bit and in a way, if you do those three, the F, the A and the I, the, the R bit sort of comes a little bit for free. Yeah. Yes, some bits of R about reusability apply, <clears throat> excuse me, apply to licensing, but equally, <coughs> excuse me, uh, but equally apply to some, you know, you'll get other benefits. But yeah. I think if you do the F, the A and the I right, then hopefully the reusability comes for a degree. I love of, that. Of... I love that. And And Nick, I think that, you know, it, it's it's up to you, but I think that's a very good statement to close on. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we walked through what is fair, why is it important, and kind of how do you get started. I think that's a it's a great narrative. Um, so so in closing remarks, what would you if somebody is interested in fair in getting started or is struggling to get some some headway in fair practices? What are some suggestions that you would give them? I mean, certainly we can share some, some links in, in, in down below later. Mm -hmm. I think it's about there's lots of great resources like Fair Plus, which is the IM IHI project that we've been involved in, has developed like a cookbook. Mm, Again, nice. very practical, just like a Pearl cookbook, you know, from from 20 years ago, mm -hmm. gives you simple recipes because it is about that. It's about also maturity models. So, again, mm -hmm. when you're going through any journey, it's useful to know, you know, where you are at the beginning, sort of as is as mm -hmm. well as thinking about what your ambitions level ambitions yeah. are and you don't have to make a monumental jump from level one to level five mm -hmm. it can be sort of incremental based on the the, the, purpose, yeah. the value of your organization and how you got the funding and everything mm -hmm. so i think maturity is really important the cookbook mm -hmm. is is really helpful and then it's about sort of using the resources out there and, and again there are lots of you know excellent uh, people that can help you know, get started and, and mm -hmm. particularly, you know, I can only, I know well the life science, but there's lots mm -hmm. of interdisciplinary 
Mm -hmm. uh, things around ontology management and basic data management plans. Mm -hmm. And it's about influencing your your peers and the management, really, because it, it we mustn't forget the uh, the change management part that yes. us, us as an individual will find it quite hard to do fair. We need the organization yes. to, 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 to come with us exactly. in, in getting the full value. Exactly. Well, fantastic. Thank you, Nick. And, you know, for those that don't know Nick, go find him on LinkedIn. And we're going to have lots of links down below, including how you can get a hold of Nick. And if you want to talk to him about more on, on Fair Principles.